Happy New Year. I was so sad to see 2020 go. I wrote a poem. No, I didn't. <laughs> Goodbye. Uh, return to sender. Before we get into a new series I've titled Travelers, we're going to be following people in the Old Testament who um, <clears throat> were following God through challenging times. And so next week, we'll start that series and we'll begin with Abraham and Sarah and traveling together. So you won't want to miss it. I'm really excited about it. But I thought as we got ready for this coming year, let's do something. Let's regroup and try to make 20, 2021 something wonderful. By the way, before I forget, those of you who are visiting with us today, thanks for being here. Those of you who are visiting with us online, uh, we really appreciate it and we're hoping you're having a good Sunday. I was discussing with my family this week about New Year's resolutions. It came up on New Year's morning. We're all sitting around and having coffee, and it was a pretty good discussion. So we kind of wrote out what we had planned for the year, and hopefully we can stick to it. But I found an article by Muriel Zaman, and it was pretty funny, pretty telling for the way things are going thus far. The idea of setting a New Year's resolution in 2021 strikes me as exhausting. After a year that thoroughly upended so many people's lives, most typical resolutions like to exercise more often, get more organized, travel more, quit juuling, <laughs> seem somehow inappropriate. We're all just trying to survive. Please don't talk to me about personal goals. In the aftermath of the past 12 months, setting such goals seems futile. If 2020 has taught us anything, it's that planning ahead is for suckers. <laughs> if we're among the luckier ones, the disruption of 2020 looked like canceled trips, postponed weddings, lost days spent, and in interminable lockdown. But for others, that disruption looked like life-threatening illnesses, financial insecurity, racial violence, and death. My life's uncertainty thrown off into sharp relief when I would spend a second planning for a better me. The most popular resolutions, top five, are these. And you'll recognize this because many of you have made these resolutions yourselves, right? First of all, to exercise, that's 19%. To diet and lose weight, that's 18%. To save money, 14%. Eat healthier, uh, more in general, that's 12%. And then do something about self-care. When I think about Christians, I, there's a few that I think most of us try to start out with. Tell me if I'm right on this. Read your Bible through in a year. How many of you have ever tried that? You start out at the first of the year. Okay, how many of you have finished it? Okay, get out of here for lying. <laughs> We're in church. Those resolutions aren't easy, but if you stick to it, there's a lot of benefit, right? Um, here's another one. Be consistent in devo daily devotions. How many of you have been consistent this year in daily devotions? I have. I'm very consistently consistently inconsistent. How about pray more? Or here's a good one. This year, I'm going to start a prayer journal. Uh, serve in the local church. Serve others in need. Well, surveys show that it's about 80% of people who make resolutions keep them past the first six weeks of the year. By mid-February, 80% have gone out, <laughs> all right? But it, on the positive side, if you can hang in there with something for 66 days, if you can hang in with it, it's easier to adapt and become automatic in your life. So how do we move ahead when we think about 2021? Uh, 
what changes do we need in our own lives? And what do we need to do to better build the kingdom of God? Well, I, I think in this message that we're going to look at today is we'll do so by getting back to the basics, which I mean study, meditation, prayer, service, and fellowship. Because it's the most basic tenets of the faith that get rattled in, a, in something that is so disruptive. When things are going normal, it's hard enough to be faithful in all of these things. But when things are disruptive, you either turn to God or you turn inward. And we're going to look at some of those. Before we get started, I'd love you to say this affirmation with me this morning. If you're joining us, it'll be up on the screen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Okay, it's not up there yet. Is it going to be up there? Okay, no, it's not. I'll say it and you can join in with me if you know it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I welcome all he has for me today. By his word, he guides me. By his spirit, he strengthens me. By his will, he's transforming me. I am his workmanship, his unique work of art, and may his will be done in me today, and I receive it by faith in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for another day to be here, another year to be with you. Lord, when we look around us, there's a lot of things that are reason for concern. To overtake our minds, our thoughts, Lord, our, our activities, our everyday moments, our peace. But Lord, we know that you have something for us. And that even in the most troubling times, you offer peace that passes understanding. And Lord, we want that. So fortify us now as we return to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, some of the disruptions of 2020. The disruptions has affected us in every area of our lives. Many have felt and have stated a sense of hopelessness and fear and uncertainty. Not knowing what to do, we return to familiar ways of dealing with things that are not necessarily biblical. We obsess over what someone said to us the day before. We worry about things that we can't change. We avoid things that we can change, right? And we hide away, it's a very common now, to hide away seeking to insulate ourselves from the world. A lot of people are doing it right now. And we find ourselves direct, directionless, disoriented, with no hope of making out of it. But Scripture can bring us back to center, can't it? Scripture can do that, right? Because humans haven't changed since the time of the Bible, have they? Are they any different? They may look different, different kind of clothes, different language, customs, culture. But humans haven't changed at all. And the people before us are like us today. And the Bible was written to humans. And it's as relevant today as it was a thousand years ago. Psalm 119, verses 14 through 16, says this. I rejoice in following your statutes. As one rejoices in great riches, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. You see, here's a point. The life nourished by the words of God is a life filled with delight and joy as you meditate on his letters toward us. A life that is filled with his word, a life that allows you to meditate on what he has to say is a life that can be filled with joy and great hope. You see, your inner life, my inner life, needs input, instruction, inspiration, correction, and grace from God, doesn't it? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, All scripture, okay, is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that, the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every 
good work. All right. We need input, don't we? What is input? Well, input is really a connection. When you have a connection with somebody else, they can give you input, especially if they know you and if they know what you need. You know, that's the tough thing about people who really know you. You can't really tell them to mind their own business because they know you and you need their input. The same way it is with God. We need his input in our lives. And then we need instruction and correction. That means discipline, knowledge, and wisdom. I'm telling you, if we ever needed that, we need it now. Because in times when things are going good, it allows us to spend our time in leisure and studying scripture. And it allows us to plumb the wisdom of God and read certain books. <clears throat> but I tell you right now, <clears throat> I don't know about you guys, but it is hard to concentrate on things like that all the time right now. It's, it's, it's very difficult. There are so many distractions. And then we need inspiration. Inspiration comes from something that is greater, something that is higher. You know, to have someone above us say, look, this is what life can be. This is what it should be. And you can get there. We can either be discouraged by that, but in God's ways and with his grace, there is no discouragement there. He lifts us up to see that it is possible with him. To have that life of peace. We need that inspiration from God. And that comes through his grace. J.I. Packer, that great scholar and author, his most famous book, Knowing God, spoke these words so true as they were back in 1973. He said, the world becomes a strange, mad, painful place and life in it a disappointing and unpleasant business for those who do not know God. Disregard the study of God and you sentence yourself to stumble through life blindfolded, as it were, with no sense of direction and no understanding of what surrounds you. This way you can waste your life. It's true, isn't it? And uh, those of you who are visiting with us, either on the web and you say, you know, I'm not a believer, but I thought I would check you out. These are not statements to divide us. These are statements that have become salient truths to those who have followed after him and know him. There's something powerful about that. And you think, well, listen, there's big stuff going on, man. You just tell me, and you know, everything that's happening. I mean, think about this year. We started this year out with an impeachment, right, of a pres sitting president. And then announcement of a virus that is going worldwide, and it's deadly. And shutdowns begin. And we thought, well, this is going to last just a short period of time. And then all of a sudden, George Floyd was killed. And riots all throughout the nation. Parents trying to educate their kids, and the list goes on and on and on. And workers, healthcare workers, having to hold the brunt of all of this daily. And people stack, people are dying. So what do we do about all of that? Go study the Bible? Is that really going to help? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because getting back to the basics, getting back on track, is really important if we're going to fortify and be able to move quickly. We'll be able to see changes that are needed to be made and respond quickly because our heart and mind are connected to God. So here's how this works. If you've made resolutions or goals, in order to, for it to, to work or to take hold, you have to see it as engaging a process. Not just, I'm going to determine myself, I need to do this, I want to do this, but you have to see this as engaging a process that continues on for a long time. First step, get rid as much as you can distractions. You know, I've lived in the house 
that we had four kids, two dogs, and that was life for a long period of time. And distractions abound until everyone had their wireless headphones, and then life was peaceful in the house. And putting a muzzle on the dogs, that helped out a lot too. There's a, a lot of things that distract us from good and the best and God's good and his best. But God wants us to sp- experience the good and the best and not f- have this false or the fake. Listen, oh, politics are the most important thing in the world. If you believe that, you are miserable right now. Don't even raise your hand. You don't have to. You can see it on your face. I'm going to challenge us to something. Stop engaging in the popular blame game. It's the government's fault. Oh, which, it just depends on which side you're on. You blame the government. Oh, it's careless people's fault. It's people who think this way is fault. It's their fault. And we're, we're just listening to and trying to pursue the fact that we are not in the wrong. That is a worthless endeavor. Because how can you prove it? So much of what we're dealing with and what we've dealt with for the last year is entering into the unknown. And how do you pre- prepare yourself for the unknown? Well, you, you go back to the basics and fortify what is needful for you as a believer right now so that you can see clearly, so that you can hear clearly. Listen. Time will bear out the truth of all of these matters that are so pressing today. But right now, they seem as to be a big distraction keeping us from moving forward in our faith. A big distraction. Do we have to bury our head in the sand? No. No. That's not good. We should bury ourselves in the pages of Scripture. Then there are those personal distractions, right? Here's the little petty ones that we have to deal with. Well, I wonder what so-and-so thinks of me. You know what? They probably don't even think of you. Or maybe trying to please other people. That's a good one, isn't it? Isn't that just the best thing in the whole world is trying to please other people? No, it never works. Judging ourselves based upon other people's values. That doesn't work either. We, we desire and expect to be validated by our peers. But here's the question, okay? Whose opinion matters most? The current popular roar of the crowd or the very God who made you and loves you and gave himself for you? Whose opinion matters more? Ultimately, his does. We know that truth. We look for approval from the people who have the greatest influence in your life. It might be good today to go home and write out who has great influence in my life. Who do I admire most? And who am I listening to and taking my cues from? This is why returning to Scripture is so important. Secondly, when you start out heading back to basics, remember this. Run your own race with endurance, focusing on Jesus as the perfecter of our faith. That doesn't mean that you have to run somebody else's race. It doesn't mean that you have to be anybody else. Be yourself. God created you. He didn't create you to be like your neighbor. He didn't create you to be like your Sunday school teacher or your whoever it is that has those influence. He made you to be growing and perfected into his image. You see, real faith, real faith is, 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 is about growing in Christ. Because the goal is not just to change, but faith is a growth process, isn't it? It's to grow because faith is a living thing. It's alive, it's beating, it's real. Real faith is growing. Growing takes time. Growing takes pruning. Growing takes watering. Growing needs nutrition. And it, but 
the fruit of it all is that we become the person that God wants us to be. When I was younger, uh, in my 20s, single, trying to be cool, hair just thinning at that point, no, you know, I needed something. So I would go into shops and, and I would look around and I would find a bonsai. Remember when they were really popular? So I buy a little bonsai tree. If you don't know what that is, it's someone putting like a, a, a normal tree into a, a little uh, plant uh, vase and keeping it small, snipping it. And I, it was during the time that, you know, the karate kid was going on and I felt Mr. Miyagi was the coolest guy in the world because he had all those cool bonsais. But I think I killed within five, five, first five years of my 20s, I think I killed six or seven. I could not keep one of those things alive for anything. But I love the idea of it, but it's not really practical. You're spending all of your time trying to keep something from growing. You know? That's, that's not the natural state of things. To grow is the natural state of things. You know what I finally did? I bought a cactus. And it took me three and a half years to kill it, but it, I had a cactus. All right, that's scripture. Now, what about prayer? Listen, from the very beginning of mankind, mankind has been in a conversation with God. We find it in the garden, don't we? We find Adam and Eve walking in the cool of the day, speaking with the Lord. Conversation with God. God calls to them after they had sinned. Where are you? We're hiding. We're naked. Who told you we're naked? I don't know. We just figured it out. Mankind has been in a conversation. 1 Timothy 2.8 says this. Therefore, I want every man everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. You see, this verse highlights this. The chaos of the human experience and the contrast of turning their attention to God in holy devotion. It's a tough concept, but what he's speaking about here is that the relationship that we should have with God is not this anger of complete disappointment and constantly, you're never doing what I want, God, and why aren't you changing things, and this is always so unfair, to not a clenched fist, but open hands to God to receive what he has. That's the principle here, and if we miss out on prayer, we're missing out on a very, very essential nurturing of our inner life. You see, prayer brings us into conversation with God. And God is already having this conversation with the world. And he graciously invites anyone into his presence. You may be here thinking, well, I don't really care to be in God's presence. I don't think he would want me in his presence. How do you know until you try? God is speaking to the world right now. He's speaking through his own son, and he's speaking through the circumstances of his son. You see, prayer should be seen as not an obligation. Oh, I forgot to pray today. I was going to pray for 20 minutes a day. And then prayer becomes this burden as opposed to, oh, finally, I get alone with God, and I can feel his presence and I can hear his words and I need that so much. How many of you love taking naps? When you were a child, the worst thing that your parents could tell you is go to your room and take a nap. Oh, man. I mean, the worst because it's immaturity and childishness. But when you get older, there isn't anything sweeter other than the ice cream and pie that you eat when you get up from the nap. <laughs> Sunday afternoon, oh, Lord, is the greatest time ever. 
Whatever food I eat is merely a catalyst to get me into that cocoon of the nap. And then you wake up and realize, ah, I have a refrigerator full of food. (laughs) Napping doesn't seem to, to me to be any obligation at all, but I look forward to it. Kenneth Boa, who's so famous in all of his writings about Uh, prayer and devotional life, said this in his handbook to prayer, so poignant. Spiritual growth is impossible apart from the practice of prayer. Just as the key to quality relationships with other people is time spent in communication, so the key to growing relationship with this personal God of heaven and earth is time invested in speaking to him in prayer and listening to his voice in scripture. As central are these twin disciplines are of prayer. Scripture is a part of our spiritual life. Most believers in Christ are frustrated by this hit and miss approach to both. But as a result, their time in prayer and the word can become unsatisfying routine, and even boring. No, I'm not talking about marriage, those of you who've been married for a while. It's no surprise, then, that most people spend a minimal amount of time in either of these disciplines and fail to develop intimacy with the one with whom they were created. You see, We need a big, huge dose of peace in our life right now. Peace in the midst of uncertainty, peace in the midst of turmoil. And God offers it to us, doesn't he? You see, prayer then is the core at God's created purpose for us. God's having intimate fellowship with us. Listen. If you think it's just things that make you happy, man, nothing could be further from the truth. You know, I've heard it said that you spend the first half of your life collecting stuff and the second half of your life trying to get rid of it. It's true. It has no meaning. So many things. But without spending critical time, okay, with Jesus, we miss out on the very reason we were created. You see, prayer strengthens our inner life. It strengthens what we need daily, hourly. Prayer is that awe. Prayer is that time with God. You see, it's not obligation if you really believe he's there. Prayer is a joyful experience because prayer brings us into God's presence. R.A. Torrey, who is most famous in his books about prayer, in his book in 1900, How to Pray, says there's no greater joy on earth or in heaven than communion with God in prayer in the name of Jesus brings us into communion with him. The psalmist surely not speaking only of future blessedness, but also of the present blessedness when he said, in thy presence is fullness of joy. Oh, the unutterable joy of those moments when our prayers, we really press into the presence of God. James reminds us, he says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's a time to listen to God, to clear out and clutter, clutter of your mind, to slow down and enjoy the beauty. You know, it's like whatever you focus on is, uh, is the thing that you believe the world is about. When there's all of the bad and terrible things going on, We forget that the the sweetness of petting a dog, of the beautiful sunshine, of the trees swaying in in the wind. You see, God made beautiful things for us, and we have to slow down 
and look for them. Learn to quiet our thoughts by the presence of God. Remember when you were a little kid? For some of you, that may be impossible. That's so long ago. You might have to look up a history book or go to a library, but I'm, I'm not going to mention any names. But <clears throat> quiet your thoughts. Because I can remember when I was scared as a kid. What would come out of my mouth, my mouth would be, Mom, I'm having a nightmare. And my mom would come into the room, and I felt better. I felt better. Jesus, Jesus, his presence comes in and calm us down. You see, with God, we're told that Jesus told his disciples that to call him our Father in heaven, holy is your name. We acknowledge his presence. We acknowledge who he is, our Father, his authority. We worship him, and we honor him above all others. I'm so happy that you allowed me in your presence. I'm so happy that you've come in when I've called to you. You see, before we get real with the living God, we have to understand that God needs to come in. So we worship him, we honor him with thankfulness, and then prayer is at the core of our purpose, and knowing God and having fellowship with him is what we were designed to do. Everything else that you and I think is important, you say, well, I've heard this before. Well, when are you going to start doing something about it? I'm nervous. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to turn on talk radio. Okay. Lose your mind. That's how, <laughs> when you get off of talk, talk radio, how better do you feel? I, I Listen, guys, I'm not immune to it. I'm not sitting up here saying, all I do is listen to Christian music all day long and water dripping and a brook babbling as I, I read the Bible. I wish that was me. I'm the guy who's like, what's going on? Quick, I want to hear what's happening. Oh, I can't believe that. I got a buddy friend of mine. Few, res few states removed over, but he's someone like me who likes to get up really early in the morning. I mean talking early. And so there's nobody else to talk to. You've read through your scriptures. You've done your early devotions. You've you got to talk to somebody, but nobody's awake. And so one of the people I text <laughs> in the morning is um, a weatherman who's up pretty early. And that turns out pretty funny because... I can make fun of what he's wearing, but he can't see me, which is pretty cool. <laughs> but this other buddy, I, I, I digress. He, he called me up the other day and said, Dave, I've just been freaked out lately. I, I've let my mind go, and I've just, there's so many different theories and so many things going on. And he said, I was really freaked out. And then a friend of mine told me about this herbal thing to take. And he goes, it's really good. Yeah, he said, it's kind of like a little dried up you know, weed thing, and you make tea out of it. And I said, um, tell me the name of that uh, again. <laughs> what are you exactly taking that's settling you down? But ev it's everybody. But we got to go back. We got to go back to a healthy diet. Not only prayer, but a healthy diet. That may be one of your New Year's resolutions. Good on you. I'm happy for you. And I hope you make it, and if you do, be sure and let me know how. John chapter 4, verse 34 says, Jesus speaking, My food, he said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. You know, he was speaking to the woman in Samaria Let's look at the passage a little further. Meanwhile, while his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then the disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food or a sandwich? And he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish it. You see, 
food in the kingdom of God is not just eating the word, but it's doing. I hear people say a lot of times, you know, I need to be fed. Really? Well, this is what Jesus says. Go to work. Go to work. I need to be fed. I need to be taught the Bible. Okay, that's a part of it, but it's not going to work unless you get out and work. How many of you believe that a healthy life is one of just eating food and not doing anything? That food that you eat is delicious, hopefully, covered in pl plenty of MSG, yellow stuff, cheese-like powders. But if all you do is eat, your body was meant to burn that fuel in order to produce something, right? And if you're not producing anything, then eating doesn't really help you. He said the real thing to do is to eat and to be fed and go to work. If you're not being fed, go to work. Spiritual food satisfies when it comes by sharing. That's, that's, that's the way it works. But it's also true that spiritual food comes along by sharing the road together. Jesus didn't just do this on his own. He took the disciples with him and then sent them out into the world. Part of our good food is fellowship. Now, I don't want to point this out all the time, but you know, a lot of the Gospels were written around a dinner table. You ever notice that? Jesus liked to eat, and so did his disciples. But the food that is necessary comes from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the, the fellowship of one another that is so needed. And right now, we're so tempted not to fellowship, not to hang out. There's a lot of ways to, to do that, a lot of ways to accomplish that. A lot of folks they care less, they'll go out in public, doesn't matter. Other folks are very concerned. And that is not a reason for any of us to divide that's the wrong thing to divide about. That's the stupidest thing to divide about, really. I mean, I'd rather divide on what we're going to eat for dinner than that. That makes more sense. Because we're, we're, we're made to accommodate each other, each other's weaknesses, each other's strengths. That's who we are and that's what we do. But we have to realize that a part of the uh, steady diet of life is to have people in your life going through life with you. That's a part of it. Listen. Those who go alongside us can give us feedback. Those who are with us are good to bounce things off of. And we need that. We need to be working together, serving together, and being together. Being together. How many of you love hanging out with your friends? If you knew my friends, hoy. No, we love our friends, don't we? And we can't wait to talk to them on the phone or, or, or see them. I, I kind of bug some of my friends a lot because I'm kind of one of those needy friends. But it's so important. And I can't imagine a life without that, especially those that you serve with. So our spiritual nour nourishment, wrapping this all together, consists of times of meditation and solitude and quiet with God, right? Meditating on the words of the Lord, l learning his ways, his values, his plans, consistent times of prayer, engaging our ongoing conversation with God, that doesn't end, entering into his presence and being filled by the Holy Spirit in private and in public. It also includes an ongoing, robust ministry. That's, that's not a few people, that's everybody. You say, well, I, I don't know what to do. I, I'm not called to preach. I don't play the guitar. I can't, I, I can't do this, that. Listen, have you looked around at the world lately? It's sort of like showing up at a, uh, a trash dump and saying, well, there's nothing to do here. Oh, there's plenty to do. 
There's plenty to do that. I'm not calling the world trash. I'm just saying that, <laughs> okay, maybe I went too far, but <laughs> you win some, you lose some with illustrations. Sorry if I offended anyone. But that's the most important thing. Here's a final thought. Proverbs 16, verse 3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Whatever you do, he will establish your plans. And I want to give you just a challenge, and I do this every year. I did this years ago, and I had a guy in the church who was sort of a nominal attender. And he said, I want to take you out to lunch. I said, sure. You're buying, right? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Just for future reference for any of you out there, there are certain standards. Now, he said, I, I listened to this message. You, you gave it on New Year's, and you said, I... I challenge you to give one year to God. And he goes, I can't shake that out of my head. I challenge you to give one year to God. He goes, I want to do that. And I, I need your help. He, he has become one of my dearest friends. He has traveled all over the world with Samaritan's Purse and various organizations. He is, when a hurricane hits or tragedy strikes, he's one of the first people on the ground. And he loves, loves serving. He gave one year to God, but that was over 20 years ago. I challenge you this year, give one year to God. Give it to him. Not to anybody, give it to God. And let's see what happens with you. Who knows, it may turn into a lifetime. Father, thank you for these words. Thank you that we can always... Just, it's like digging in a treasure chest, your word. Thank you, Lord, that your word extends to anyone who will hear, anyone who will call upon your name. Lord, we pray that many today would give their hearts to you, call out to you and say, God, forgive me, and I want to give my life to you. That many would say, I, I got distracted and disrupted this year, and Lord, I want to give 2021 to you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand? Who oh, is like him? Lion and the lamb seated on the throne. Mountains bow down, every ocean rolls to the Lord of hosts. Praise and night, from the rising of the sun to the end of every day. Praise and night, all the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing. Praise, sing praise, sing praise. Amen. That is a very good start to this year. Steve's going to give you a few announcements in just a minute, but I'm going to give you a blessing right now. Never want you to come to this place without someone giving you a blessing. You find that Blessings are hard and few to come by. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. God smile on you and gift you. God look each one of you in the face and make you prosper. And may 2021 be the year of God fully in your life. God bless you. Pastor Steve.